als. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you are catching us again on a, another episode of the Book Asylum Podcast. I'm Jack Childress. That's Kristen Vincent. Down there, hanging out, as always, the brain of the whole operation, Doc Freed. We, this week, oh, get hi. the honor of having on one of the most known horror writers out there. Like, literally, like. People know this name. If you've read horror, chances are you have come across the one, the only, David Moody. Sir, thank you. I bow. Thank no, you thank for you. coming on the show. There's absolutely nothing I can say that's going to live up to that introduction, but thank you. <laughs> Man, I, I'm going to start in the place that I know you best from, um, mm -hmm. The Bleed. You wrote oh, yeah. with my favorite author of all time, which is Mark Tufo. I love mm -hmm. him, love him, love him, love him. Mm -hmm. Although I do have critiques about Devil's Desk, but anyway. But you did a thing with him and another one of my favorite authors, Chris freaking yep. Philbrook. You yeah. guys did this thing together. How did y'all make that work? So, well, it's very rare that I get to speak to people who've read it. So, did it work? That's my first question. It did. Because it was such a weird thing for us to do because we're also very different. Apart from the fact that we've got different, different places, we've got very different writing voices. Um, and when I, when we first started off, I think there were a couple of moments where we all thought, "Is this going to work?" But it was just, it was a mad experiment. And I guess that's the thing about writing, isn't it? I think you've got to keep pushing yourself. And there's no way you can't not push yourself when you're sitting with Mark and Chris. Not that we ever sat together, but it was just it was just such an experience to bounce off each other and to be to be writing my part of the book in my way. And then to have this bit come from Chris and this bit come from Mark. And I'm thinking, well, wow, these are so different. How are we going to turn it into something cohesive? So to hear you say that it was cohesive. Is, it was. It's good. It's good. I mean, that's why yeah, it's still it was... selling. I mean, it's it's the bleed is a series because it's a series you know there's yeah, yeah more than right. the one you know i mean it's a yeah. freaking series y'all you literally gave us a little bit of all of you and that's what i loved about it was the fact that i got mark i could feel mark's writing i could feel chris's writing and then we're getting your writing and that was my first introduction to you was mm -hmm. through this i would have not known about you had it not been for you doing this thing with Mark and with Chris and yeah, dude, y'all, y'all pulled it off. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah. It was very, we, we did each book differently. So when we started book one, we didn't know how we were going to work together. So it was literally, you write your third, you write your third and you write your third. And if that first book is very much three separate thirds, but then by the time we got to the end of the first book, because of what we did in the story, everybody's, messing with everybody else and people from here are ending up there so you had no choice but to learn how to write in everybody else's voice sorry if i sound really pretentious talking about writing in voices etc et no but, god no <laughs> yeah that, that, that that's just how it was and by the time we got to the end of it i don't even know what was coming out but it was it was such a lot of fun writing it it was really it was a real experience and yeah um uh, Mark's huge uh, with Zombie Fallout and he's huge with Audible so he got us an Audible exclusive which was brilliant and it got a, a great audience uh, I think one of the things that we all wanted from it was just a little peek into everybody else's audience as well so that was great um, obviously we all I think we we knew each other and our readers mostly knew the other people but it was just a, a great way of of each author getting exposure to two more audiences so it was a, it was a huge amount of fun Dude, that is fantastic. Now, I'm going to have to ask you, because this is my way of poking at Kristen over there, who likes to be our quiet one. Have you ever written any poetry? Me? No. No. None? But Not none. nothing? None. No, uh, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, zombies are ugly, and so are you. Nothing? <laughs> uh, see, I, could, I, I couldn't match that kind of thing. I know, <laughs> but, honestly... Seriously, yeah. William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was born 30, 30 miles down the road from me, but that's as close as I get to poetry. I, I I couldn't. I'd love to try. It's just, I don't know. I think I'm very fixed in, in what I do. And um, 
yeah, uh, there's not a lot of room generally in apocalyptic fiction, my kind of apocalyptic fiction for poetry. I don't Maybe know about ahead. that. Maybe uh, here's what we'll do. I got an idea. It's a crazy idea, totally off the rails. Kristen could write a poem, a shorter one, mm -hmm. and then you put it in a book where a character is reading this poem out of a book they found just lying on the road when they're just kind of hunkered down and hiding out. and They're just flipping pages and then... Bam, Kristen yeah, Vincent sure. yeah, we, poem right there. We we can do that. <laughs> get get writing, Kristen. <laughs> oh God, that's not a problem with this one. Oh my, oh my Jesus, she's well. How how many now? What one hundred fifty, two hundred poems? Where are we at? Oh, more than that. Yeah. 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 And I'm she's, I'm constantly writing. Like I can probably write like ten or twenty in a day. In all honesty, if I wanted to. That's great. See, I see ain't that oh. thing? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't don't get the impression I don't admire poetry. I really do. I just know that it's something best left to the experts like yourself. I do. I do like to read poetry, um, more contemporary stuff than the old. Uh, when I was doing my exams at school, I just I, we were forced to study Coleridge and Wordsworth and stuff like that. And that's I'm not trying to disparage it, but that's not my bag at all. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of contemporary stuff I like. So yeah, put something together and I'll find a way of slipping it into a book. Yeah. Holy yeah. crap. I, wow. I like more, you know, just like how I feel, uh, especially mm -hmm. everything that's like going on in the world and everything. So it's definitely class more. Wise, uh, class why is dark. It's dark. Yeah, but that that's interesting because that's why I write. I write always write in response to something that's going on around us. Mm -hmm. My only worry at the moment is because I predominantly write apocalyptic fiction, we're kind of being pushed out of the market because the world's becoming so apocalyptic. Yeah, we're getting so 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 close in so many ways to something catastrophic happening, and I'm I'm starting to think, well, people aren't going to want to pick up a book and be reading that as well. They're going to want some light relief when they pick up a book. Right, but we'll see. So, we'll see. And also, I have a question. Uh, so mm -hmm. you are always posting incredible photos do you do photography on the side as well no, I, I I don't but it's something that I've I've got into okay. I've got to say it's all it's all thanks to the fact that we all walk around with cameras in our pockets these days and we never used to and um the, the one thing I have been able to do a lot more over the last few years is spend more time with the family and do a bit more traveling so I've kind of learned how to take decent photos uh, and also, I think you can't, when you're doing it on a phone, you can't always take that much credit because really the phone's doing a lot of the work for you. If you can just get the right kind of comp composition, then mm -hmm. the phone is kind of doing the legwork for you. But I guess you've got to have a bit of an eye for it. I, I, I'm really touched that you said that because it's, it is something that I've always wanted to, to do. I've always been kind of a frustrated filmmaker. So I'm kind of experimenting with photographs and, and video that I'm taking on my phone. Because when, when I was young, because I'm old now, when I was younger, when I left school, I wanted to make films, but there was no way, there was just no equipment around. I had a video camera that you kind of rested on your shoulder and you couldn't edit anything and it was terrible. But now we've all got like movie quality um, cameras in our pockets, which is just great. So it's it's something I'm experimenting with. But cheers for the compliment. I'll take that one. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I... uh. I took a photography class back in middle school and um, mm -hmm. I just, I fell in love with it. And uh, my husband in 2014 had gotten me a camera, a Canon. And so I, yeah. you know, I play around and everything and, you know. I think so. that's the only way, that's, that's the way we learn everything these days, isn't it? By playing around with it. Mm -hmm. And again, the advantage we've got with things being digital now is you can, do it and you can make a mistake and for every decent photo that i might post there's probably 100 200 sitting on my camera roll that i would never show anybody well in hell worst case scenario you can google it or go find a youtube video okay how do i make this canon 616 eb camera do this mm -hmm. probably go find it it's going to be out there you can find anything on the internet well, getting Not back on the thing. book, get, getting back on the book train over here. Mm -hmm. After all, this is the book asylum, and we got you all committed and everything. Um, out of everything you've written, mm -hmm. what is your most famous or your most favorite scene that you've written? Favorite scene? Oh, I can't yeah. talk about it. Oh, 
that good, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, all right. Then in that case, in, in that case, let's sell it. What book is that in? It's in Hater. Ah. I don't know. I don't know if what you've. Uh... Ah, thank you. Are you, are you <laughs> let me ask you the elephant in the room, since you just brought up haters. Yeah. Is a movie ever going to be made? Ah. Oh, I don't know. It's I, I'm I'm. I've got to be careful about what what I say here. Mm-hmm. Um. So for those who don't know, the the the, the movie thing is is a, a long ongoing saga. So I wrote the book in 2006 and I have no idea how, but it ended up on the desk of Guillermo del Toro's assistant. So Guillermo del Toro and Mark Johnson, um, who eventually he, he went on to be the producer of Breaking Bad. But at the time he was working on the Chronicles of Narnia film and, and he'd done Rain Man in the past and loads of things, Oscar winning producer. So they got hold of this book and um I don't know how it happened, but they bought the rights. Um, yeah. So we got very, very close right at the beginning to making the film. And it was all set up. The script was being written. Sorry about name dropping here, but the script was written by Glenn Mazzara, who mm-hmm. was the showrunner on the second season of The Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. Um, he It was going to be directed by J.A. Bayona, who did The Impossible. He went on to direct one of the Jurassic Park films and he's just made a film, I can't remember the title of it, but it's it's just about to go to Netflix, which is about the the, the football team that got stranded in the snow on the Andes and ended up, you Mm -hmm. know. So we almost got to film it, but it just kind of fell apart at the last minute as these things do. And it went round and round and round for a while. Um, I took the rights back because it didn't seem to be going anywhere and sold them to a guy here in the UK. And working with him, we got very close a couple of times. We had a, a couple, we almost got to film a pilot for a TV version, but again, that fell apart at the last minute. Damn. A couple of years ago, we went full circle. And this is where I have to be careful about what I'm saying. The rights went back kind of to who had them originally. And something is set up and something is in play but we've kind of been derailed over the last year by the actor strike and the writer strike Mm -hmm. so there was a lot of movement towards the beginning of this year end of last year beginning of this year and it's kind of taken a pause um I'm, i'm hesitant because we've been to this point so many times before but also there's a lot of stuff that's been cancelled and a lot of stuff that's been abandoned because of the impact of the strikes on the industry. And and I absolutely support the strikes 100% because they, oh, they, yeah. they were necessary. But I, I do fear maybe that hate will be a casualty of that. If not, I hope to have some uh, some big news pretty soon. But really, that's that's the only answer I can give, I'm afraid. Half an answer. So what, here, my, th- go ahead. Th- Sorry, say it, say it again. Rights are back with Guillermo. Um, kind of almost that that he's involved uh, I, I believe that he's involved but I'm probably saying too much there and I shouldn't all right I, I won't I, put I you say. I just you know it's one of those things I watched and watched it sort of yeah. not get made and then okay and then not got made and it's like okay uh, no I'm I'm really hopeful because I wrote that book in 2006 and it yeah. felt pre- pretty relevant but it's the only thing that I've ever written that every single year it feels more relevant Mm -hmm. and regardless of the side that you take if you look at what happened here in the uk with brexit and what's happening again now with the current government and you look at what happened with trump in the us and again i don't want to offend anybody i don't want to take any sides at all but there's just this real polarization of society and there's no um there's no crossover there's no well maybe you could be right it's all it's all you're right you're wrong and that's what hate Mm -hmm. is about it's about taking that to the ultimate which kind of leads me back to the scene that I can't talk about, but you'll know, Doc. There's a there's a scene about two thirds of the way through the first book where it 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 kind of it changes things. I don't want to say anything at all, but no, no I but, know exactly but, what you're talking about. I thought I thought you might, um, yeah. but that scene. But it's not just the impact of that scene, and I think that 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 scene itself is why the books sold so well. It was it was that took what had been a pretty straightforward pre-apocalyptic apocalyptic story and then turned it into something completely different Mm -hmm. but it just it just happened as I was writing it I'm a great planner when I'm writing I make sure that I've got it all all planned out 
But I have to be completely honest, when I was writing that book, the last third went in a different direction. And when I was writing that scene, I got halfway through it and I thought, hang on a second, what if? And then it kind of twisted. But I really don't want to say anything more. I just want people to buy it. It did. <laughs> That's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Love it. Well, now, what... Here's my thing that I keep getting hung up on. There's a lot of really bad movies getting made and mm -hmm. put out there. And I've never understood why you can't get better books like yours for example like mark's like chris's what but it's, why it's, can't it's, we get them on you know out there it's really, it's really difficult and i can say that because i've had a bad film made of one of my books i don't know if, i don't know if you're aware but the first autumn book the first book of my autumn series uh it was filmed back in 2007 uh independent production thing in canada it all got agreed at the same time as the, the guillermo del toro mark johnson thing happened and I, I just agreed to both of them thinking, well, that's a big Hollywood corporate thing. And that's a little indie film company. So if I say yes to both of them, something will happen. Mm -hmm. And the indie one was made and it was it was it was made with absolutely the best of intentions. It was made um, with as much money as they could get together. It had a decent cast. It had, um, you know, David Carradine from Kill Bill. Mm -hmm. yep. He was in it in his, it was the last role he filmed before he died, I believe. Um, and Dexter Fletcher who was a big TV star over here. He's now, he's since gone on to direct films, like he directed, um, let me think, it'll come to me in a second, the, I think the Elton John film, Rocket Man, and I think he took over the Bohemian Rhapsody film from Brian Singer when he got fired from it, you know, so he's, <laughs> he's making big films. Um, but with, with Autumn, everybody's heart was in the right place. Everybody tried but the film just didn't work. It just didn't come out. It wasn't, they didn't have the resources and the, and the skills, I think, in some areas to be able to realise the vision. And I think sometimes that's what it can be. It's a it's a, a good film becomes a bad film. But you're right as well. A lot of crap gets made. And yeah. um, I think the, the, the soul-destroying thing for me is really the number of remakes and the number of sequels and the sequels to sequels. Because really, the quality of a film doesn't matter to the Hollywood studios, does it? It's just how many yeah. backsides can we get on seats? How many people can we get to stream this or watch this? Yep. And yep. Yeah, it's 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 disappointing. And it's it's something that I'd like to... I think I started off when I was writing, when I first started writing, um, I published independently, and I still do uh, with, with most of my stuff. But I always wanted to make films independently. And I think we were never able to do that, but we kind of are now. And I'd well, like how about that. how about you fly your ass over here to the United States of America and come hang out with me and Rich and his best friend from childhood? And uh, we're planning on doing a mockumentary thing where we're mm -hmm. hunting cryptids. We're after go Bigfoot. Ahead. We're we're after the Dog Man. We're after all these different characters, and it's going to go horribly wrong. I mean, it's going to be hysterically horribly wrong. Come yeah. over and make movies with us, man. Of course. Okay. I I'll make a movie here first and try and make a bit of money and then buy a plane ticket and come over and do it. That'll work. Yeah, let's get that done. <laughs> okay. All right. Get you over there. Because, I mean, can you honestly, you get three rednecks and a British guy. That <laughs> is comedy gold. It's a combination, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, and speaking <laughs> yeah. of which, Carl Meadows was watching earlier. So, hello, mate. Hello again. Hello, hello, hello. Teas and crumpets and things. Well, here's a proper accent for Carl. Hello, mate. And I really enjoyed I only read the first Lockie book, but I thought it was ace. And I told him at the time. Dude, you got to finish the series. She just keeps getting wilder. You got to she keep was, going. She was wild enough in book one. But yeah, I do have to finish the series. I've got a I've got a reading pile that's like that. Ah, dude, welcome to the club. <laughs> you got a whole club full of dude. folks right here. All right, Chris, let me ask you something. Now, have you thought about trying to do some zombie stuff? anything along them lines even in a poem yeah um i have a couple ideas for a uh like a end of the world zom book so do it i say yeah you I heard it from the man i can't say too much um but i am definitely wanting to talk to a couple people who have written you know, are a little more ad 
advanced and experienced with the the material and writing to get some ideas and you know kind of get some help why well, hey, i'm gonna suggest this guy freaking david moody right here knows how to do that because he is you've done nothing but just blow people's minds just like i said i put you i put you with mark with chris with david simpson i mean there's like a collective of you guys and gals i'll put i'll put courtney constantine and alicia uh morgan in there too and uh ca hoax i'll put you there's like a collection of you guys that are just unreal like how did you write this and make it so compelling to where it drew us in the way it did, the way it just beat the crap out of us at times and then still like powder just back up. You're fine. Get up. Let's go. I mean, what was the writing experience like as you've written the stuff you've written, man? Um, I kind of just fell into it. That's 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 the thing. I've I've got no real training other than a couple of um, exams from school, um, uh, and and I kept trying to write a novel and getting nowhere. And it was actually this is going to make me seem really really old now, but it was <laughs> the the the, fir- the first of January nineteen ninety four. So thirty years ago next month, I thought if you're going to do this, you've really got to go for it. So I made myself write a page every day, and planned it all out didn't go back until everything was till each draft was finished and by the may of that year i got my first novel written which wasn't a zombie novel and when i look back at it now it was absolutely crap and i rewrote it 20 years later but but yeah that was kind of the the introduction and i've i've kind of learned on the job which is i think has been the best way but for me the the key to any book it's 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 the people it's the characters and it's what you put them through so I like to write about the, the the little catchphrase I always use is ordinary people in extraordinary situations. So it might be the end of the world. It might be that zombies are in the back garden. It might be that the suns are going to explode or there are aliens here, whatever. But I'll always write from the point of view of you or me or the guy next door or that person walking down the street over there. And I think just try and keep it grounded in that way, because if you do that, then I think uh, the reader can identify with it. And if well, they can as feel a- the horror... You know, as as a new writer trying to be wannabe imposter, you know, writer, how the do you do that? Like, I'm trying to put my head into other people's heads and figure out, like, how would they speak or what would they say or what would mm-hmm. they do? And I'm struggling with it. Like, I'm so stuck in my own head that I can't get to their head. How do you do that? How do you well, disconnect? This will make me sound like some kind of pervert, but I people watch all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm always looking out and just seeing what's going on. Um, I, I had a job where I used to work for a bank many many years ago. Um, I worked in a like a processing centre. We had about 150 staff, and we were we were told oh, the centre's shutting down in 12 months' time. Everybody's been made redundant. And it was my job to kind of manage the team in that time. And I just watched these people for the next 12 months, 13 months. And I saw so many like relationship problems, so many fights, so many um, issues that people were dealing with. Their whole lives were being turned upside down by the bank's decision to shut where they worked. Is that a cat you've got there? Is that a tail just disappeared behind? Yes, that is my pussy. Who uh, uh, The one thing I have published in this world is based on this cat. His name what is Domino. Creature. He's named Domino because those two dots on his side. And I actually wound up writing a short story called Domino about this cat that saves its owner from a dogman attack because it can grow quills out of its little hairless body and then launch them like darts. Well, so, I didn't yeah. expect you to go that direction with the conversation, but that, that's really cool. Yep. Sorry, I can't. <laughs> yep. I, I, Sorry. I can't resist cats. We've got cats here as well. So that kind of threw me off. Yeah, um, he's a weirdo. Yeah, but just hearing you say that there, it just shows that, that I think people do approach things in different ways. Because if I was writing a story about a cat, the cat would be doing something very normal. Certainly, wouldn't be any quills or anything. It <laughs> it's, it's just different strokes for different folks, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, now, in fairness, that was a uh, a homework 
project given to me by right. some friends and they were like okay here's you gotta include a lantern a red ball gown a hairless cat um to kill a mockingbird and something else and i just wrote this story and that's how i wound up with a hairless version of that guy huh. see that's cool but for to, to my mind if you if you want to write you want to write well and i'm not saying that i write well i'm just saying that if you if you want to do it you i think you've just got to follow what you want to do i think you've got to write it for yourself first and foremost write the stories that you want to read and i think that that's you i i hear people saying a lot you've got to write to market and you've got to tick this box and tick that box and i just can't i wish that i could you'll probably make a lot more money if i could do that but I just think you've just got to write the stories that if you were in a, a library or if you were looking on Amazon, if you were looking at Netflix, if you what what kind of story would you pick if it's not there? Yep. Write it. That's my philosophy anyway. That makes a lot of sense. Um, another question I have is how long does it take you to. Like from the time you start a book to the time you finish and you're ready to release it how long does does that take you oh that that really varies for me um i think it depends on how comfortable you are with the genre and i think it's good sometimes to write something completely different so i've just written three more i say just written over the last four years i wrote three more autumn novels and for me that was that was quite straightforward it wasn't like a production line it was but i did I knew how long it would take me to plan it out and then I kind of got into a rhythm for the books so they took me about nine months each to write um I'm writing something I'm writing two books at the moment one of them is based on an idea I had about 20 years ago and it's just gone round and round and round and I've been writing in it in this form for about two or three years I think I'm almost there and another one was just an idea I had at the start of this year, which I guess if I added up all the time I've written, been writing it so far, probably about three or four months and I'm into the final draft of that. So I think wow. it really, really varies. It's not, for me, it's not just, yeah, it, 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 there's a lot to consider. If it's, do, you uh, have, do you have any that are just sitting in the mothballs right now? They're just, they're there, but you have no intention of touching them anytime soon? Yeah, I've got a couple. Um sometimes it just doesn't work out and that's 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 really that's really hard to swallow and that was a real for me personally that was a, a huge lesson um, but but you keep them you you still keep, keep them, them over there yeah 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 so because i think i'll come back to them and like i just said i've got an idea now that i'm finishing up which is probably 20 30 years old wow but if it's worth writing it's going to come back but there are other books that have just uh, so when Guillermo del Toro and everybody got involved with Hater, everything exploded for me for a little bit. And all the books that I'd published independently got picked up by a few different publishers around the world. So everything, for a bit, I was living the dream. But that never lasts. Unless you're Stephen King or somebody like that, That it doesn't last. So I had that for a few years. And I think it kind of lulled me into a, a false sense of security. And I thought, whatever I write now... Is going to be exactly the same and people are going to go crazy for and that obviously that's very naive but you kind of get yourself into a, a, a mindset and i wrote this book and i was going backwards and forwards with my agent he was looking at it and it we were about 18 months in and then we both said you know what it's not going to work so i've still got that not physically behind me on my bookshelves anymore but it's still on the computer it's still there and, and i think even though that book is never going to see the light of day, elements of it do. And the stuff I'm writing at the moment, in fact, that one of the books I'm writing right now, the, the one I've been working on since the beginning of the year, it's um, a lot of that is inspired by the stuff I wrote previously. So even if a book doesn't get published, it, you're not wasting your time by writing it. You're always learning, you know, always developing. All right. Well, I'm going to jump in with a question here from a guy who would have been on the show but he's stuck at work, so he can't be here. Dungeon Dan. That Hello, Dungeon Dan. Freaking crazy guy. He says, David, <laughs> while creating your stories, let's use Hater for an example. Do you find it more challenging to come up with weapons to use for self-defense than your American counterparts who live in a gun culture? Yeah. I do. But I also think 
because as you, as you know we don't have we do have guns here but i don't know anybody that's got a gun you know i'm sure that there are plenty of people around who have <clears throat> excuse me but uh, yeah absolutely very different from from what you have over there in the states um, big dick around my bag oh i know what's coming out here it's no not ain't a cat, is it no it's not a cat it's, it's, it's my it, i have a stun gun zzz, zzz. i have a stun okay. gun i don't have a gun gun now that one Get Kristen over there and that one over there <laughs> they're both armed to the teeth so I know where I'm going when the apocalypse hits I'm heading to Kristen's house but you no know, she's the, a the, the, the thing here though here as in the UK is that there are very few people like that so it doesn't matter that I haven't got a gun if it's the end of the world probably nobody else has either yeah um, so so yeah you have to get more inventive. So usually it's knives and sticks and whatever, which sounds really archaic. But dude, I'm telling you, works. the lost art of finding a stick or a limb that has that split in it. So you can take a rubber band and put it here mm -hmm. and then use it as a slingshot. Yeah. Yeah. Totally wasted art. Totally wasted art. It's there. But also I would say on this that um the autumn books in those books, they're very different kind of zombie books. So up and now, up. Oh. Oh, sorry, I thought. We, we, no, we had a we got sorry. a kid in got a kid interrupting over here. That's all right. I, I, I usually have here as well, so don't worry. Um, so in the autumn books, very different zombie books. Um, you're either it's a virus that sweeps the planet, everybody dies, or ninety nine percent of the people die, and the story is about the one percent that survive, and the ninety nine percent get up, or most of them get up, and uh, they're obviously after the one percent. But one of the ways they do that is through sound because the world's so quiet now. There's so many people dead that the survivors, if they make any noise, they've suddenly got tens of thousands of zombies around them. So the last thing you want to do there is start firing an Uzi or an, uh, whatever, an AK, whatever. I don't know. I'm just making these things up. But as soon as you, you fire a gun, you've got more and more trouble. You might get rid of one zombie, but you've got a thousand more coming towards you. So I think that was very much written from a UK point of view. Which is another reason, probably, why the the Canadian film died a death because people are watching it thinking, well, "Why don't they just get a gun and do something about it?" Yeah, yeah, but they ain't got them. Because y'all got like like the sporting uh, shotgun is like the the max you can really carry, right? It's just the the like for yeah, shooting but, skeet or whatever. Yeah, but no nobody carries them. You know, yeah. it's it's just it's just not a thing over here. And and what's funny, it hadn't been that damn long ago. I was at Walmart back around the, you know, the deli meat section and the cheese section and all that. And mm -hmm. the dude pushing his cart ahead of me had a like forty five or a nine millimeter. I'm not sure which, just strapped right to his hip, just walking on through the store. And I was, yeah. and my mom actually pointed it out, you know. And I'm like, hey, I want to stay close to him because if some shit breaks down, that's the guy that I'm gonna be hiding behind. See, well, it's, it's a very different. It's, it's a very different perspective. Because if you're outside of Denver County, we open carry all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come come but, to the yeah. best. <laughs> but I've got yeah. to say, just listening, just listening to to what you said there about seeing a guy in Walmart with a gun, and your reaction is, "I'll stay by him in case anything happens." The reaction of somebody here in the UK, if you see somebody in a supermarket with a gun. You just run. You go the other way, <laughs> because the assumption is that they're going to use that against you, not that they're going to come to your aid and and help you out. Yeah, see, we see it completely different over yeah. here. We don't we yeah. don't see it that way. It's like if you if if the government has allowed you to hang this on the side of your hip, you're trustworthy, or at least we would think you are. You, I mean, because we have the weirdos. That's why we have the school shootings and things like that. People that can go get a gun. They do, and then they do bad things with it. They also usually don't have it on the side of their hip and just draw it. They've got it hidden in a knapsack or under a trench coat or, uh, mm -hmm. you know. None of them had concealed carry weapon licenses, so. Yeah, well, now, with you being in the U.K. writing, you know, having yeah. to use weapons and all that, what weapon did you research that just made you go, holy shit, I've got to get this in my books? No, sorry, that's probably not the answer you want. But I it mean, wasn't really. I thought you could be excited about like an M1, blah blah blah. You know, like mm -hmm. badass gun. Like no, no, I, I, really. Honestly, 
Yeah, well, this is, again, this is probably exactly the opposite of what you want to hear, but I'm just not interested in weapons. Ah, uh, well, damn it. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, well then, what is your favorite bladed weapon? Damn it! Ah, uh, no, you see, we don't. There's just no focus on weapons here. So when, in in the key, the key scene that we were talking about a minute ago in Hater, it's a bread knife. So the guy's just been cutting a loaf, and then it's a bread knife that does all the damage. Oh so, my yeah, god! It's just you... stuff that's hanging around. Oh, you bastard! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, say okay, again, okay, fine then. What is your favorite sandwich? Because the favorite UK sandwich. are known for sandwiches. Are we? Which I, okay. I do love. I do love a good sandwich. So what is your favorite sandwich? Uh, it's disgusting. It's my Christmas sandwich. I have it every Christmas. Ooh. So fresh, fresh crusty bread, mm -hmm. fresh ham, coleslaw, Stilton, dry roasted peanuts. Okay, wait. What was the Stilton? What the hell is that? You don't know Stilton? Stilton's no. cheese. No. Blue cheese. Like blue cheese. Oh, it's a blue cheese. Okay, see, because mm -hmm. I'm 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 in the southern United States, dude. I don't know any of this stuff. What are you talking about? Yeah, we about? might not have guns, but we have cheese. <laughs> we'll shoot your cheese with our guns and then eat your cheese. I love cheese. <laughs> 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 All right. So, what makes that sandwich taste so damn good? It's just the collision of all these things together. What's the matter? Why are you screwed up your face, Doc? Hold slow. But you're talking about just, I mean, with with like mayonnaise on it. Yeah. So ham and cold salt with mayonnaise and peanuts. And, and Stilton. Well, yeah, he said Honestly, it. Honestly, you have to. I'll you've got to experience the ham it. Ham and Stilton. The rest you can have. <laughs> okay. Well, I wasn't going to share it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, but like he was giving us a bite. I mean, for Pete's sake. All right, then, uh, moving along, since you do have egg on that, what is your preferred way of having eggs? Yeah. Scrambled, right. fried, parboiled, fried. Yep. Now, what right. level of fried? What level of fried? All the way fried or yep. yucky? All the way. Yeah. That's You've my got to guy. Mini minimize that yellow running yolk all over the place. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. Because to me, that means it's not done. See, I've it's, got to yeah. have mine at least uh, over medium. Gross. I, I like the white cooked. I don't like it slimy, like the over mm -hmm. easy, but I think the over easy is just. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you on that. Mm -hmm. All right, it's Doc, just... what, what's your. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh. You were no, going. No, no, carry on. No, it was, only, it was egg related. So carry on. <laughs> I'm not a big one of eggs, but they've got to be really, really cooked. I mean, that's my girl. Open I'm a way. scrambled scrambled for me, man. Scrambled and dry. They got to be done, but not singed. Don't singe them, motherfuckers, because I know singed because you can smell it. Gets on my nerves. Pissing me off. All right. Kristen and Doc and me show up at your doorstep. Mm -hmm. We're hanging out right in your yard. Where are you taking us for brunch? Say that again. Sorry, you broke up a little bit there. Mm. You're in my yard. All right. So, yeah, we're there. Where are you taking the three of us for lunch, brunch, dinner, whatever you want to call it, supper, whatever? Where are you taking us? Oh, man, we've got so many good options here. We've, I would take you. We've got a little place down the road, a mile down the road. Um, it's a street food venue, right? So you can choose whatever you want. It's a beautiful place. Good beer. And loads of street food vans around the outside. So now, sure what well, what are they serving? Find anything there? What what's on burgers, the menu? What are we looking at? Burgers, pasta, pizza, um, chicken, fried chicken. You you name it, it's always there. So I'd take you there because I wouldn't presume to want to decide for you. If not, I'd take you. For, do you call you wouldn't call them carveries? A big roast, traditional roast Sunday dinner here. I'd take you for one of those. That see, that's what I was looking for right there. Is Take us to a traditional place because we already know the burgers and stuff. Come on, man. Where were we going for some traditional UK fare? So we would go to a little pub um, called the Nailers Arms. And it's very cozy. You've got a log fire burning and it's, uh, you have a carvery. Roast beef, roast turkey, roast gammon. Pile on the vegetables, pile on the gravy. 
Yeah. Okay, what's ga- what's gammon? Gammon is ham. Ham, okay, okay. It's the proper name for ham. It's Sorry. not the proper name for ham. Ham is ham. It's the UK name for ham. <laughs> we're, we're, we're like I said, if you haven't figured out already, we are totally screwed up in the head over here in the United States. It's just how we roll. It's what we do. But no, gammon, I'm, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna no start using here. that. I'm gonna start using that though. Gammon is how I'm gonna start at ordering my pizza. I need pepperoni, sausage, and gammon. I want to see what the hell they say. And most likely it's going to be, do what? Yeah, go back to the Probably UK. what's coming back, yeah. But yeah, that is freaking phenomenal. All right, let me ask you this then. How many conventions do you do a year? Uh, not enough. I used to do like four or five. Um, but since COVID, it's really dried up. And see, I, I had, um, at the start of COVID, I had a heart attack, which was not very helpful. Yeah, good. And and so um, since then, I've kind of slowed down a bit and not really gone driving around with a car full of books. I do need to do more. I do love them when I'm there. It's just the effort of doing them. And they're not they're not like the conventions you have in the US. I don't think they're not generally they're not as big. They're usually quite small. So it's um, and it, unfortunately, it does come down to money. So you have to look at it and think, OK, well, is the attendance and am I likely to sell enough books to break even or to make some money there? So. So, yeah, not not enough conventions is the answer to that. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to say this now. I, and I mean, as stupid as it sounds and it does sound stupid. Get a hype man or woman. Get you a cheerleader that right there is. It's a game changer. Having someone, I didn't write the book. I, I love it this much. Someone cheering for you. Get you one of those because they do help. They do help. Because, you I'm know, sure you, figure, you figure you go to most conventions, you're sitting there at the table, you're just chilling, you're hanging out, and you're just waiting for people to show up. You know, maybe you stand up, shake a hand or two. Nah, man, you got to have this person that's there like, hey, hey. You just looked over here. I caught you. You looked. Come here. Come here. You need that person because they do matter. Because I get to be one of those for Richard. And I, I ain't gonna lie. I ain't shameful about it. It's it's so much fun, first off, to get to do it, you know, because mm-hmm. I'm helping my buddy out. But it does work because we've sold books to people that frankly, if I hadn't been yelling at them, they would have never came over to us. And we yeah. got them involved, and then the following year, the husband, who wound up being the one that read it, shows up at the table going, I'm ready to get book two, and buys book two right there mm-hmm. at the table. You know, like, get you a cheerleader, man. You need you one. They help. We're good peoples. Cool. Fact, that's what we're, things, dude, this is what we're doing right now. That's what the Book of Solomon is all about. We are cheerleading everybody, David Moody. He's right there for Pete's sake. Search him on the freaking Amazon. Cool. Let's go. See, this is my problem. I'm very British. We're nice and quiet and reserved and, and well behaved. I need to be more like, I'm not saying you're not well behaved. Yet, but No, I'm I, not well we behaved. Be no, okay, me. well, you're not well behaved. We need to be more like you. Or maybe I need to be more like you or sell more books. No, if you were more like me, you'd be driving a forklift. So let's not do that. <laughs> Let's keep selling the books, man. Dude. But yeah, because part, part of the reason I love writing is because I get to sit in this room all day on my own and not speak to anybody. See, so it's kind of a catch-22 thing. So question. Um, have you, uh, I guess, thought about writing outside of what you're used to? Um, maybe branching out to other uh, genres? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do the the book that I was talking about the um the book that I've been working on for the last couple of months that yeah it's very much not in my usual genre I do I do like doing that um but it's getting the balance isn't it because it comes down to economics unfortunately as well and I think you have to write a certain number of books that your audience is expecting if you want to be if you're going to make some money mm-hmm. so it's a yeah it's something I want to do more of definitely I don't know what genre yet kids books because there's one behind you yep (laughs) (laughs) that knucklehead man 
Here's my thing. Hey, what are your feelings on Splatterpunk? Splatterpunk's cool. It's got it. It's got it's 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 got loads of people who love it. It's it's not not my bag personally. I've got to say, I'm I'm like just character driven all the way. I like a bit of gore. I like a lot of gore, but I in my stories it doesn't necessarily. It's not there for gore's sake. It's there for a, a purpose, but. I do love splatterpunk, and I I love to sit. If you can get a really really gory movie, there's no better thing to watch with your mates is there than that. I'm what not... have you seen? Uh, was it Dead Alive? I think that movie's kind of iconic, you know, amongst the are like you... splatter. Are you talk is a uh, Peter Jackson film. Yeah, the one where the yeah. guy at the end has the lawnmower and he just runs through everybody. It's called yeah. It was called Brain Dead over here, but yeah, oh, I absolutely, yeah, I absolutely love that film. Um, I think Peter Jackson, he was an he was a real hero of mine because he just started off making the stuff that he wanted to make. Have you seen his other early films, Bad Taste and Meet the Feebles? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, just astonishing and just so full of gore, so full of vomit just and over everything. the top and just like absolutely. why, yeah. why did you do that? Because and you look at this stuff and you think. Okay, so this is the guy that then went on to helm the Lord of the Rings, you know, the biggest franchise yeah. for, for for decades. And you think, yeah, but yeah, it's his real skill. But he started off doing what he loved doing, and it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, full of admiration for the bloke. Not a fan of the Hobbit films. Yeah, but, yeah. wasn't I, really I, a fan of all of them, honestly, because they were too damn long. They were. Uh, long. Oh, for Pete's sake, you'd have to like. It's like get the popcorn. Screw you. Bring dinner. Like <laughs> you're gonna be here for a while. Like it's, ugh, way Wait, too if there's long. Any, if there's anybody who hasn't seen Brain Dead, uh, Bad Taste, Meet the Feebles, and then Brain Dead or Bed, Dead Alive, whatever you want to call it, um, you should always look them up because they are just yes. phenomenal. They are absolutely brilliant films. Yes, they are, and and so cheesy. Like with the uh, mm-hmm. well, for me, Dead Alive. You know the the monkey thing attacking dude's leg. It was just so yeah. cheesy, and yet yeah. it worked. You know it freaking worked. Has now, it still you ever... got the record for for the most amount of fake blood used in a film or something? The final scene of that with the lawnmower. It, it probably does because yeah. um, I'm looking back on horror, and yeah, I'm gonna say that's probably the best sploosh that we've had. Like it's definitely literally just there's just nothing but just showers it's just mm-hmm. it's death it's dismemberment it's insane do you have a scene that you wrote that even comes close to that no well again i think my stuff is is so like very very different but there's a scene in hater that a lot of people come back to um and that's to do with the vasectomy Ooh. Okay, yeah, already I'm I having. Can to I leave, can I leave on, it there? Hang on, <laughs> hang on, hang on. Let me move around. So I know the girls here will be just fine with it. It's like, well, yeah. So yeah, it's, oh, making yeah. Me, it's making me wince thinking about it now. Um, yeah, yeah, because haters of ha- hater essentially is about the human race splitting in two. And in the first book, people don't know what side they're on until they're on it. So people will change at the least opportune moment and. Yeah, there's a surgeon that changes halfway through a vasectomy, and so instead of doing that, you do a bit of that, and it's yeah. ow, okay. ow. Okay, yep. Hang on. Next question. Yeah, you, you can't oh, see it on I'm camera. It all over again now. Yeah, it's all wiggly. It's wiggly. Yeah. yeah. Let me um interject something. We were being the editor. Yeah. I mean, let me correct something. Dead okay. alive. To be the record holder using a thousand gallons of fake blood. Um, Evil Dead, Evil Dead remake, um, in uh, 2013, used a whopping 50,000 gallons for its glory climax. That's ridiculous. And, um, Markiplier has yet to confirm the amount of blood set uh, to appear in their movie Iron Line, but it looks like that's going to use even more to become the new record holder. Wow, that's incredible. You got an editor here. I've got to fact check everything. I'll tell you, it. she's on it. She's on it. <laughs> That's great. No, I'm pleased you said that. So the last yeah. time I the last time I used that little fact was before Eve, the last the Evil Dead remake was made. I'm sure then. Oh, but well, there you, go. you know. That's what I'll say. 
And and for right now, it's still Evil Dead 3, the 2013 one. Yeah. So, but when Iron Lung comes out, mm-hmm. I think they're going to squish by with just a few more drops. Wow. Thank you. We're going to have to check that one out as soon as it drops. See what the hell is up with that because I'm all about some blood splattering flying around. Mm-hmm. It's all good with me. Man, as we are closing in on the end of the show, and mm-hmm. I need to ask you something seriously. As a wannabe writer, and don't give me the traditional write what you know or just do it, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. How do you get someone that is already writing, has written some stuff, Doc has edited it, and I'm just suddenly stopped i'm like into the rails i don't know where to go from here i don't know what to do i don't know how to get my enthusiasm back it's like Mm -hmm. i've lost the enthusiasm how do i do that that that's a really good question uh and i've been there a few times um i don't know how to answer that in my experience I just can't not write. And I know that sounds really pretentious. The 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 mm-hmm. ideas are, are, are always coming in. We talk about that all the time around here about writers. You can't not write. Yeah. It's a compulsion. You have to do it. Sometimes when I'm write, writing something and it doesn't and it's not working out. Or if you've got to write to a deadline or it some then it can be a real slug and I, and, and that can be hard to, to you can find it hard to motivate yourself then. I love the start of the process where you've just got the idea and a blank sheet of paper and it's just go for it. Um, the the one thing that I always do is I plan, I probably plan too much, but I do, I come up with a, a, a an idea. It's usually the end and then work my way back and then turn that into a synopsis and then break that down scene by scene, chapter by chapter, and then start writing. And if so, I so, the, so you're a so, plotter, not a pantser. 100 percent yeah i think everybody ultimately everybody does the same amount of of planning everybody does the same amount of prep i know that we talk about plotters and planters it it is true because if you've got everybody goes from an idea to a finished book and everybody who goes through that must do the same must follow the same steps just in different places and just call them different things i think a pantser would just do less of the first bit Less, less of the planning bit that I do. and then That would be me. That's, that's me, because like right now I'm getting ready to start chapter six of a book that I'm trying to write, mm-hmm. and the plotter part of it is they drove away. The rest of it, it's okay. just... Do you know the, the other thing that I'd say, though, that I'm sure this is true for most people, when, when you get to the end of your first draft and you look back at it, and then you do your second draft. Ninety nine percent of what's in that first draft just goes. I think that the real, the real writing comes for me after that. I think again that's another part of planning. Put it for me, the first draft is more planning, and it's only when I've got to the end of the story and I've gone through the whole thing, and I'm thinking, well, if that had happened earlier, or if this had happened there, or if that person had done that, that's where the real writing kicks in for me. So again, I think it's all part of the same continuum. You've got your germ of an idea, you've got your finished book, and it's just whatever you do to get there. But if you are, if you, you, you talk about like losing it, enthusiasm for something for for writing, um, is that because you can't steer it to where you want to steer it, or is that because the idea appear, doesn't appeal enough? If the idea doesn't appeal enough, then I think. Hey. The your, running your joke enthusiasm would come through. The, Sorry, go on. The running joke amongst us is how I like to write the juicy bits. You know, mm-hmm. I like to write the kill scenes, you know, and the you know, the destruction and all the stuff blows up. I struggle with the so Jan woke up that morning and she got out of bed and she went and put on her nightgown and she went down because she smelled bacon and mom was cooking bacon on the stove and mom always made the best bacon and so that yeah, but stuff. My, but my question would be, who gives a shit about mom and the bacon? Does it add anything to the story? Does it drive the story? Because I think well, every single line has to move the story forward. And if it doesn't, well, I never describe what characters look like because... I think that's just wasted time. And when you're reading a book, you 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 create the your own image of the characters in your in your head, don't you? I never that's go into true. Masses of detail about this or 
what color mm. the door they just came through was. And there's a there's a discussion in the first autumn book, which when that somebody's sitting there trying to work out why 99% of the population have died and why the other 1% have got up and why this is happening and why that's happening. And one character turns to the other and says, it doesn't matter. It's happened. Just deal with it. And for me, I think that's what the books are about. Just this is where we are. Let's deal with the situation that we've got. And if we find out why it happened at the end, well, that's great. But often, oh. I, I, yeah, I, I, I'd rather just see where the action takes us. Hey, well, since I don't think either one of them two are going to ask it, I'll ask it. Then what are your feelings on the way Stephen King describes every freaking thing? Well, but my feelings are it wouldn't work for me, but it works for Stephen King, and he's made a hell of a lot of money and sold a load of books. Okay. There's a there's a guy called um, James Herbert. I don't know if you know James Herbert. So he's I heard British, the name British writer. He died um, must be about ten years ago now, but he was probably the, uh, our equivalent of Stephen King. And but I, I hate that when you say. Oh, he's the new Stephen Equivalent. King. Equivalent, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I would hate to be described as the new Stephen King. I just want mm. to be the first Dave Moody, you know? Damn right. Um, but I, James, James Herbert, he when he released his last book, I was really fortunate I got asked to host the only two signings that he did, and we had a conversation in front of an audience. And um, and just through talking to him for a little while, it was just so clear that that people do things in very different ways, and they write in very different ways, and, and you just have to do what works for you. And just have, and I guess there's a bit of luck, and you've got to hope that that there will be enough people who want to read the stuff that you write and the way that you write it. As I said, I'm very different. I totally respect the way that Stephen King writes, but I I hate picking up a book that's that thick. Yeah, for real. Books a bit like that. So in the same way, I don't want to watch a four hour film. I'd rather watch a ninety minute film. Mm -hmm. Hang on, just a damn second. Ugh. That. Yeah. See, I admire it, and I'm not. I'm not at all saying anything. Dis I would never dream of saying anything disparaging against Stephen King. I'm just saying, for me, I'd rather pick up a book that's that thick. It's the one thing I hate about Kindles. You don't know how thick a book is until you yep. get going on it. They get to going on it because, like, uh, my buddy. I'm gonna pick on my buddy Angel Ramon since he couldn't make it back for the show today, but he put out um his uh. <laughs> Um, Penny Coladas and Rat series. And so I get this book and it's like this big. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah it's up here in the wall back here behind me. But it's like this big. So then I open the thing up and the print ding dong is like this freaking big. Like, yeah, you ass. I can't read that. I'm blind. And so, you know, but yeah, man, the thickness of a book that can matter a little bit but i guess too if the, the print's fucking small then that makes it even worse like what the yeah, hell did you do yeah there are exceptions hang on i'm just going behind me now ah uh, uh, we're getting in depth hold on here comes the i advert. like it here comes the advert we got to see his butt That's ladies and gentlemen she wants, wants some more that, that sure? was that showed about twerk Thank you, twerk. thank you. Uh, I'm not twerking. That's introduced sex. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, just just as an example, the last autumn book, last three autumn books. So quite short. Second one again, quite. Thin. But then I couldn't resist. It's one story, so I couldn't resist putting them all together. Oh and, my god, I want that. But I think. I want it. But I think what a lot, I, I think. Authors who write books like that are just writing more books like this, but just putting them out like that. It's this yeah. is one story, but I've wanted to separate it out into three books because, well, economically, it's easier for people to buy books like this, and it means you've got a, a steady income and it and they're you know, then at a reasonable price. Something like that big, well, they're there. Okay, well, now if you were to guesstimate each book individually. How many hours would they be on an audiobook? Eight hours, seven hours, ten hours? Well, um, pathetically, because like, I'm a real nerd with numbers and things like that. I used to work mm. in operations, so I can say that each one of these is about nine, eight and a half, nine hours. Okay, see, that's that's exactly why you keep them separated, because me, I do all my consumption of uh, books through audio. 
Mm-hmm. Once my eyes started going bad, I can't deal with the headaches, even with the reading glasses. I just can't. I do try to read, but uh, yeah, it's not cool. So I do a lot of things through audio. And so an, an eight to nine hour audiobook dude is that's a okay. But, but same thing again, the audio version of, of the combined one is 33 and a half hours, I think. Yep, yep. It's got a few extra stories in it. Yeah, I've got one of those. Uh, oh, crap. I can't remember his name. And I feel horrible for it. But um, mm-hmm. Slow Burn. I've got the complete series mm-hmm. where he put it out just as a one book block. You know, like you yeah. got the whole thing. And I was all over that, too. But no, nah, dude, you need to make sure that you keep getting all your stuff put on Audible because that's where I'm going to be able to find you best. And Make sure you get a good narrator. I know a few. I could send a couple your way. Okay. Well, I would just say, if you if you like English accents, which is where we started, the guy that narrated these the most recent autumn books, his name's Aubrey Parsons, and he is amazing. Just give that a go. In fact, I'll right, send well, you some codes. Well, sweet. All right. Well, since uh, I got Kristen, who is our schedule taker, we are going to be doing some shows in, uh, is it March? It's March? Yes. Um, we're doing a narrator special throughout the month of March. Mm-hmm. And do you think you could get in touch with your narrator and come on to be part of one of those? I think he would definitely do it. He's a real character. He's great. I'm, I'm obviously speaking for him then, but yeah, sure. If you send me the details and I'll get in touch with him and ask him. Incredible. That one right there, that oh. pretty woman right there. That's who you're going to talk to. Not me, not my Perfect. face. I will... Uh reach out to you i do unfortunately i have to get going um however i will uh send you a message here soon today and we'll discuss everything and i'll give you some dates okay perfect that's great and well, hey real, 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 real quick because we are at the end of the show uh kristen where can everybody find you yeah so y'all can find me on facebook and instagram tiktok and you can also find me on threads and you can find me on Inst- uh amazon yes Awesome, awesome, awesome. Doc, where are you at? Uh, Doc Freed, all lowercase on Amazon. I'm sorry, on, um, sorry about that, not Amazon. On Facebook or at uh, doc at avoarts.com, A B O A R T S.com, short for Aboriginal. Man, thank you so much for being on the show. I was so happy to have you here. We, It's the end of the show. I mean, everybody's got to run and go do what they got to do. But, it's been man. Great. We're going to have you back. You've got to come back again. This was awesome. There is so much more to talk about because I definitely want to start picking your brain more about the writing process because I'm trying to figure it out. I just hadn't. Hopefully I'll be able to tell you a little bit more about the film as well. Sweet. Well, tell everybody where they can find you. Uh, Easiest thing, go to davidmoody.net and you'll find all my links there. And loads of junks and some photos. And thanks again for the compliment. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, Doc, do you have something to finalize? No. Please come back and talk to us. We look forward to speaking with you soon, mate. It's been great. I'd love to. Thank you very much. For the greatest guest we've had most recently, David Moody. That's Kristen Benson. That's Doc Freed. I'm Jack Childress. This is the Book Asylum Podcast. We will see you next week. Peace out. You're the host. Oh, good. <laughs>